Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. Tonight, I'm here with a co-interviewer, Dr. Rhonda Chervin. We worked together for many years at Holy Apostles, and we now have a radio show together called The Dynamic Duo. And tonight, we're interviewing David Dowd. How are you tonight, David? I'm doing well. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited to have an opportunity to introduce that song. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I'm I'm sure it's going to be a very good interview. Um, why don't you read Why don't you read aloud to us, David, the title of your original interesting book? Sad songs of you mm -hmm. from the front lines okay. of the spiritual battle between the culture of death and the culture of life. Okay. The Sidewalk Advocates Journal. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Before we actually begin doing the interview, would you like to open us with prayer, David? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, we gather here before you in service to the lives of the people who dedicate themselves on the sidewalk to trying to save lives. On the sidewalks of abortion clinics, Every day they meet women and men who process in a painful journey from a parked car inside a building where a death of their baby occurs and then back to their car. Dear Lord, we place ourselves in the service of these women, of the suffering that they endure of the faces that any one of us has seen on the sidewalks and on your love and on your forgiveness dear lord we pray that we can become a culture which values babies that does not see babies as problems that sees babies as an opportunity for a community to come together to organize their resources to support the mom to support the dad and support the baby as the baby your gift enters this world we ask this with the guidance of our blessed mother through jesus christ amen amen well thank you david that was a beautiful prayer um so teacher yeah yeah so could i ask you what it is that led you to write this book um, yes, of course you can. Thank you. <laughs> this is a very interesting, you know, uh, moment for just another person who happens to be on the sidewalks, um, but who's been blessed since 1992 to have had a series of introductions with people who have become my heroes, people who have motivated me because I've seen the sacrifices they make to try to save lives and i'm a pretty shy person and you know in four years of uh returning to um the south where i spend the winters i've gathered with some good friends and their examples day in and day out and the thought occurred to me that i'm a writer maybe i can do something mm -hmm. And I realized that as a writer, you observe and you learn and you, you know, we're each unique and indiv in individual. Mm -hmm. I've certainly, I have a degree in American studies and writing. I've worked for a couple of newspapers. Maybe I should just observe and report what I see. And as the reader enters into the, their engagement with this book, the people they meet, the observations they may encounter through the words that, you know, God gave me to write this book. We're going to see this story from a different perspective. We're not going to see the story from the perspective of the culture of death, of the legacy media, or of the political circles that support Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we're going to witness the suffering of women who fall victim to this culture and mm -hmm. hopefully our hearts can be stirred 
mm-hmm. to support them and their babies. Mm-hmm. I've never been to uh, one of the sidewalk, um, one of the sidewalk movements, I guess I would call it. I don't know what you call it. But um, I've often wondered if when women leave there, they're immediately sorry or elevated that now they don't have to have a baby that they don't want. Cynthia, one of the most interesting experiences, and Rhonda can speak to this as well because she's been on the sidewalk also, but every woman going in is a different story. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most phenomenological kind of uh, gatherings, you might say. Mm -hmm. Ending time on the sidewalks. Yes, we see 20 to 30 women a day, three days a week, and we see, you know, some faces twice because they make an appointment and then come back and complete the chemical abortion. But they all the whole range of emotion. And mm-hmm. the emotion starts with denial and occasionally you you encounter the regret. Mm-hmm. My um, my old roommate Sean Brogan in Boston, I was Sean's roommate for ten years. And Sean's on the sidewalks in Boston for the past 25 years. He said to me when he first started on the sidewalks, he could talk to people going in. And he could, you know, reason with women as he walked alongside them. Mm -hmm. And he said, now, most times, they ignore you. They've got a death score standing between you and them. And they're just tunnel focused. And coming out... Oh, yes, but I I think it's very important to say from the get-go, Dave... Um, right. I'm a commentator on this book because I'm a friend of Dave and also I've been a sidewalk counselor for 30 years, so I'm very familiar with all of this, is it's not just a negative book about how terrible abortion is because you get these saves. So in the middle of hearing about someone turning off what the sidewalk advocate is trying to propose as alternatives, how... We can help a woman for any amount of time afterwards to take care of that baby because often the excuse is uh, financial problems or not the excuse, but the reason given. But we we know people who will take care of them as long as they want (laughs) and take care of the baby. And then when you see someone responding and actually taking that ride with one of the sidewalk counselors to this rescue place it's just thrilling to read about this well you know this is a good point and thank you Rhonda because we need you know keep balance in in, in the perspective and this is the intention of this book is to provide you with the balance I guess my thought is and I tend to be pretty focused when I'm speaking but my thought is that the the struggle that women endure is the the experience, Cynthia, that you see in answer to the question you asked, that you see from the sidewalk, but every woman is different. Mm-hmm. So, I'm just, this is not uh, a negative question, but I, I'm just wondering how much success, I mean, saving one is worth it. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just wondering what the success rate is because I have such an impression that, you know, that that idea that death isn't really death to the baby because it's not really a human person. Um, I think of that as being so inbred in so many people that they're not going to respond well. Well, you ask a very important question because your impression is uh, probably shared by many people. You know, yeah. um, Operation Rescue Boston mm-hmm. maybe had, um, at one point in time, I know they had 30 or 40 saves a year. The past few years, they've had 15 or 20 saves in a year in Boston. But the the real story, to in answer to your question, goes beyond the day-to-day. Because mm-hmm. one of the points that Rhonda can attest to, and one of the points that I can certainly attest to, is that we're planting seeds. Yeah. We're meeting women in their moment of crisis in their moment of denial when they are surrounded by a culture that is 
I'm just steering them into the abortion clinic. Yeah. And when they when they leave, you know, they've just experienced what when Senior Philip Riley described as the worst day of their lives. Yeah. And they become a murderer. Dream, Senior Philip Riley. And yes. when you go ahead, Rhonda. Yeah, but a huge difference now is that our sidewalk counselors can bring them to a place where they have the ultrasound, they see the baby in their womb, and when they see the baby in their womb, like 80%, 80% don't have the abortion. So there's tremendous um, upsurge in saves from that. There mm -hmm. is, Rhonda, but the, in, in the place where I was, and I know they have mobile ultrasound uh, vans now, and we've got crisis pregnancy centers, um, more than them, more than, you know, maybe more crisis pregnancy centers by a factor of uh, three or four than abortion clinics in this country. But the challenge for a woman in that 10 or 15 seconds that a sidewalk counselor can speak to her as she's walking into an abortion clinic, the probability of her changing her mind to go to have an ultrasound has got to be recognized. And it, the actual factor is pretty slim. But the point is that these are opportunities for us to be to engage people at this critical time. And by planting these seeds, and you'll see as you read the interviews of people who we met on the sidewalks of Florida, the examples of people who, as Rhonda said, work in the CPCs, who meet the women who do maybe not go to the abortion clinic, but they go to the Christ Clinic Center instead of the abortion clinic, see the ultrasound and keep their babies, the, the results are phenomenal. The, mm -hmm. the results are blessed because the maternal bond has not mm -hmm. been ruptured. Mm -hmm. And so this book is an opportunity to acquaint the reader with this terrible place that so many women, you know, coming out of our colleges, coming out of our Students uh, for Life has been a, had phenomenal success. Um, you know, working in college campuses, live action. There are so many young women who go to college and don't have the support of a circle of people who encourage them to have their babies who don't know what the experience is. And we're hoping that sad songs can help them see the other side so they become better informed. Well, one thing that's very, very important is I did side sidewalk counseling Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock in different places for 30 years. But these ones in this place, which we won't name the city because we don't want people to be killed for being mm -hmm. sidewalk advocates sure. one day. So we're not mentioning where it is or the names of people in the book. But... The thing is, these sidewalk counselors get there at 5.30 in the morning to pray for these people, not 10 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning at uh, Holy Apostles where you and I taught. Um, I could hardly believe it because I lived in California so long. Those seminarians came out to pray the rosary in front of the abortion clinic when it was 20 below. They still were out there doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a little nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. Oh no, this, this is another good sign. The fact yeah. fact made by a sidewalk advocate, you know, wherever they may be. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, and I've been in, I don't know, more than seven or eight different places here in the Northeast and in the South, where I've had mm -hmm. red, you know, residents where I've been able to participate in the sidewalk, um, you know, the door is open at 7 in the morning. The door is open at 5.30 in the morning. The sidewalk counselor is there four months of the year in every kind of weather. If they're playing babies, you know there's going to be people who are going to be trying to save these babies. And mm -hmm. one of the points that um, a dear, dear friend in the, during this past six months said to me, he hoped that our book could portray the sidewalk advocate in, in the proper light. And my hope is that the reader will encounter the care, mm -hmm. the understanding, the, mm -hmm. the uh, fearlessness, but mm -hmm. the bravery, but the compassion. 
The one thing I used to say in California when Operation Rescue started, um, I was there with a group of seminarians. It was the first mm -hmm. Operation Rescue. And I said to the black policemen who were guarding the clinic from us, I said, we're doing this because of Martin Luther King. Do you get it? That's why we're peacefully doing this. And uh, they had to listen because I was, I talked very loud. <laughs> you know, Dr. Um, King's face is Dr. Alveda King. And I've had the privilege of meeting her. She's on the staff of Face for Life. And she heads up an organization called Civil Rights Begin in the Womb. And Dr. Alveda King had an abortion herself. Mm -hmm. She became a member of Silent No More. And she will tell the story of the mistakes she made. And this is another development that comes out of the work we do in the sidewalks. And this is one of the fascinating, uh, you might even say redemptive, parts of this beautiful story. Mm -hmm. One of my Protestant friends said that the pro-life movement is the most ecumenical movement in the church. And when you consider the women who've made Rachel's Vineyard Weekend and have found healing from their abortion, and the mm -hmm. women and men who, who are part of Silent No More, who have fathered a baby who was killed by abortion and come to admit the regret they feel, and Rhonda can attest to the phenomenological healing that could take place when somebody realizes God forgives you for the mistakes you made, you begin to recognize that these voices need to circle back into the mainstream of where women are. Well, the advantage, the advantage, I think, of women who actually have remorse um, is that that may help to prevent other women from having abortions. But um, no, that, that is something we do, Cynthia, every time as they come out after having the abortion, we talk to them about this healing and we give them literature mm -hmm. on healing. Mm -hmm. So we are directly trying to reach out to the women who have already mm -hmm. made the wrong decision and hopefully will not mm -hmm. make it again. Mm -hmm. And yeah. another point that came up, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Cynthia, but on the points that Rhonda just made, <clears throat> our Holy Father asked us in the pro-life movement to accompany women after the abortion. Mm -hmm. And if there's a... A, a, a theme that comes from the experience of having written this book. The theme mm -hmm. is to hear the words the Holy Father has said. Mm -hmm. We're providing the reader an opportunity to encounter the pain and struggle granted through an individual's observations and etc. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. we, as Rhonda opened up our, our interview by reminding us that we support women with um, housing, with job assistance, with postnatal care. Our crisis pregnancy centers are doing an extraordinary job of helping mm -hmm. women move back in the mainstream. People mm -hmm. are going to see a woman named Sammy in this book, and Sammy's from California. The story is stunning. Absolutely stunning. And mm -hmm. she recognizes that moms need to be told a baby is not a problem. Mm -hmm. A baby is another responsibility. Mm -hmm. And she gives examples of friends of hers who suffered terribly but turned around and raised their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I understand what you're saying and I agree with it. However, I also think that the majority of women who are going to have an abortion are not thinking of a baby. They're thinking right. of a few cells, Good. or they're thinking of an embryo. Or they're right. thinking of their own life and the fact that they don't want a child. So, um, as Rhonda knows, I'm an abortion survivor, literally. My mother tried to chemically abort me in 1949. And didn't and, you write uh, a book to tell the story? Yes, I did. It's called it Survivor, a Memoir of Forgiveness. So, yeah, so she uh, tried to abort me chemically in 1949. She told me when I was 11. And so uh, I asked her, you know, I mean, it was like, did medicine not work or whatever? And um, 
she said she stopped taking the medicine because she said she stopped taking the medicine. So I asked the logical question, why did you stop? And I was hoping she'd say because she realized she loved me. No, <laughs> she was afraid she might die too. So um, I tell that story in my book, uh, which is not, yeah, I think I sold like six or seven copies. I don't care. It's not, I didn't do it for money. I did it to get the message out there. But um, it seems that the cult, I mean, she was doing this in 1949, long before Roe v. Wade. So when you look at how this um, availability of abortion has really, I think it's changed the whole country as to how they feel about life and death. I think it's had effects on, on things like uh, euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, possibly even genocide, you know, capital punishment. So, I mean, if you can kill a baby, you can kill anybody. But, um, but yeah, I, I know that the work you're doing is really good. I know it's positive. But I, I just look at this mountain of people who want abortions and we'll get them one way or the other. And but it's, that, you know, it's it's like going under a tidal wave. It's- The desperation you know. is real. Mm -hmm. Today, the desperation you described is real. Today yes. on EOTN's uh, Daily Mass, Father Mitch Pacwa said the Mass. Yes. Mm -hmm. Today is the day of St. Joachim and Fade Ann. Mm -hmm. Father Pacwa observed the timing of when Sister Fatina was given the image of Jesus in Divine mm -hmm. Mercy happened to correspond with the rise of Hitler in Germany and the rise of Stalin in in, 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 in communism. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he recognized the merciless ideologies of Hitler. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to say that we, as a, a capitalist in this country, we accept the ideology of capitalism become merciless. And he spoke mm -hmm. exactly of the points you just said. He spoke of abortion. He spoke of contraception. He spoke of euthanasia. And, he's, and he, I think he was, maybe this was my expectation, but the trafficking of children oh, yeah. you know, are, are, are also examples of the merciless uh, grind mm -hmm. of, of capitalism. But when he spoke in terms of the grace of our Lord's message of mercy and the timing of the introduction of St. Faustina mm -hmm. and Paul II writing Evangelium Vitae and you know our Catholic voice as we stand on the sidewalks and our Christian voice this is an ecumenical movement yes, we are it is. by, by mm -hmm. many of our Christian and Jewish and even yeah. um, you know uh, non- religious people who who understand that life in the womb is human. Mm -hmm. So this is a battle between good and evil. It sure and is. Standing standing on the front lines in the battle between the culture of life and culture of death and trying to bring some light. Trying to bring some light into those wounds, recognizing how sad mm -hmm. and how factual the world you describe is and the way that world is being played out every Saturday morning on an abortion clinic in your own town. And maybe the reader will pray, and maybe we'll only sell six or seven copies of this book. But mm -hmm. we are providing resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not downing that at all. I'm just amazed at the size of the problem. Um, I was talking to, uh, in another interview, I was talking with... Um, trying to think of who it was, but it was a woman who had been um, in Africa and she was praising, she was a medical doctor and yep. I can't think of her name, but she was praising how in Africa, you know, they're trying to get people to have abortions, but the people don't actually want them. So they're somewhat pro-life there. And I mean, and we think we're a civilized country. <laughs> Oh, I mean, really, think about that. It's Cynthia, I do. <laughs> Father Paul Marx was in more than 100 countries around the world. Yeah. And he brought the bishop from Uganda and the cardinal, uh, Cardinal mm -hmm. Arinzi, 
Remember Cardinal mm -hmm. Arisi? Yes, I do. And and they were pro-life leaders. And now look at Cardinal Sarah. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, uh, we see other cultures in this world mm -hmm. um, who are ostensibly Christian. Yeah. And who don't have the apparatus surrounding them that we have surrounding us. Mm -hmm. Talk about the culture of death apparatus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their voices can be heard. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that part of our responsibility is to make our voices heard. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Well, the, the, reason, the reason that I had brought up Africa is yeah. because, you know, uh, you think of the, all the poverty and all of that sort of thing, but the, the doctor I was talking to said that, you know, the governments are trying to bring abortion and, I guess, birth control in, and the people don't want it because they still value children. And right. she, he w she was saying, you know, maybe Africa will be the place that, that is able to save this. It's, you know, because save, you know, save, save us from our culture of death when you have such an example. Oh, well, Cynthia, I never, hmm? oh, Cynthia, I never, I couldn't believe it when this wonderful bill was passed. I mean, I never Roe thought we'd Wade. have a bill. Yeah. No, with Dobbs against yeah, abortion, yeah. and there yeah. are now states where they don't have abortion. It's amazing. So, I mean, this is happening. There is hope. There is hope. But I mean, yeah. I think I think it would just for anyone who is just wavering on this to read David's accounts mm -hmm. of this act of the actual process is just very very inspiring to see that people are willing to make this sacrifice to advocate mm -hmm. on the sidewalks and mm -hmm. just the whole thing. So I think that the book do yeah. great good. The response is this. Mm -hmm. In 1990s, actually in 1980s, I was in a Renew program in Hartford mm -hmm. with St. Justin's. Mm -hmm. And St. Justin's was an inner city black parish and mm -hmm. we had an opportunity to join with a parish in uh, Glastonbury, Connecticut, known as St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had um, um, urban and suburban Catholics in a discussion mm -hmm. on Renew. And mm -hmm. something that we noticed that was very, very interesting was that the people from the inner city, and I'm speaking, uh, I can name a couple names, and the one young man I'm thinking of was a senior at in Connecticut. Now he's a reporter for Channel 2 in New York City right now on the NBC affiliate, David Ushery. Mm -hmm. David was working with his peers and he was walking home from school and talking about the dangers of contraception. And he believed in life. And he was talking peer to peer. And mm -hmm. what we saw in, in the suburbs was a more intellectual approach where people were talking about Dr. Ruth and they were complaining about Dr. Ruth but they weren't discussing person to person. And see, this is another, uh, this is a layer in this mm -hmm. whole e evolution of our, of our uh, culture. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no question that there are people in Africa, there are people in Asia, there mm -hmm. are people um, in South America, Central America, some of our finest pro-lifers are mm -hmm. from Central South America. Yeah. But we want to be open to the gifts God distributes through Pentecost mm -hmm. and he's distributing gifts in our nation as well. Mm -hmm. I want to just Stories. mention a very positive example that I have in the book where our sidewalk counselors in LA and Los Angeles in the Watts area, this black area. Okay, mm -hmm. so we would be we would be praying in front of this clinic. Mm -hmm. Well the, the one the man running it was so wonderful as to make friends with the woman who was running the clinic. He made mm -hmm. friends with her by taking her out for coffee and sitting and talking to her. And after a year of this, when people came into the clinic, she would say to them first thing, those people outside can help you with everything you need to keep the baby. Only talk to me if you can't accept all that help but they those people can help you to keep the baby isn't that a miraculous that's it a relationship is. Rhonda our our journey flows through relationships 
Mm -hmm. Friends of mine in California made this point to me many years ago when Dale and I, my former wife and I, were in an engaged encounter in Southern California. A young couple in the group turned to us one evening and we were talking about our experiences and so on. And this young couple turned to us and said, our church works through relationships, works mm -hmm. through friendships. And so this is our objective. Um, mm -hmm. Our um, uh, group that, that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about here in this book, um, there are several of these folks uh, who, who do become friendly even with the people mm -hmm. who work mm -hmm. on the other side. And mm -hmm. um, this is where the hope is. And these are these are where the, the little little tiny tasks can take place. Our Lord is in charge. His Holy Spirit is in charge. He decided mm -hmm. the Great Wall would, would fall. John Paul II and Ronald Reagan were the coordinators. Through the mm -hmm. grace of God, they were the instruments. But we are the little people in the salt mines just doing our little piece. And this book mm -hmm. is, is an expression of you know of, of providing an opportunity for the reader to encounter the face of suffering. Mm -hmm. Sammy said, look at their faces. Mm. Well, I have a grandson who owes his life to this. My daughter who was not married, she called me up and asked if I would come to visit, come to her house with a pregnancy test was a long drive down the LA freeways. I get there, I say, why did you ask me to come? She said, because I knew if I went to the abortion clinic, I might see you outside praying and you would see me. So instead I'm asking you for the pregnancy test so I know I won't kill that baby. I won't abort the baby if it's positive. And it was positive and her lover of only two months, he, when she told him that she was positive, tested positive, he who was an atheist, he came running over and he said, don't abort the baby, marry me instead. Mm. So these things can, that's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Cynthia, your experience is a key part of this whole interview. And I want to thank you for speaking up because here we are explaining anecdotal uh, mm -hmm. stories and we know the numbers. Mm -hmm. It is we amazing I'm here. It is really amazing I'm here. <laughs> right. I, right. Yeah, I mean, there. The, what saved me was that my mother was afraid that she would die. And so, um, you know, I mean, what can you say? Well, <laughs> I, have to, I have to say something that I don't think that, because she didn't, she, she was afraid of death, not because she loved you. She hadn't seen you yet. It didn't yeah. mean she would never love you if she knew you, even though she was a very you know, mentally disturbed person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She case, was, she was the meanest person I ever met. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, that okay. woman could chew, she could chew iron bars and spit out bullets. <laughs> okay, so, so Cynthia, for sure yeah. you could have on the show also a picture of your book and how to order your wonderful book. It's, a, yeah. it's an amazing book. We have another book to promote, Rhonda's book on the feminine. Mm -hmm. When I started to read this book, uh, Cynthia, you may be familiar with this book. I was astonished. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the year you wrote this, I think you were in California, Rhonda. She's, he's talking about feminine, free and faithful, mm -hmm. which is one of my best books. I think you probably have it, Cynthia. But yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, Sebastian Mafoud, the publisher on Roof Books, He's giving away free copies now just for postage. So mm -hmm. it's my name, Rhonda Chervin, Feminine, Free, and Faithful. And it's an analysis of how you can be feminine and also free and strong if you're faithful mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit. 
Mm -hmm. So it's an answer to feminism. And, yeah. and what a beautiful companion mm -hmm. for sad songs. As I, I discussed this with, uh, um, with Sebastian, and then I had an opportunity to discuss this with the Trappist Monk a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And what we began to recognize is the women who are walking in on a Saturday or Monday or Wednesday uh, at a Planned Parenthood, oh, at an abortion clinic, um, these are women who probably never had a chance to read Rhonda's book. They never had an understand an opportunity to, to witness how they could be feminine, free, and faithful, and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And yeah, see, I this is one of the, when we think of your poor mom, and how, how mean-spirited she became, you know, this is what our culture does when people turn away from God. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, this, is, this is what Father Apocla was talking about today with original sin. Mm -hmm. We fall into the deadly sins, we fall into anger, we fall into pride, we, we fall into greed, and, mm -hmm. and, and we don't feel grace. Mm -hmm. And when I read Rhonda's book, I said to my, I just started Rhonda's book, but I'm, in my first reading, I'm beginning to recognize. Mm -hmm. Well, you should read mine. That'll be a real, that'll be a yes. real treat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, in the book, I make reference to the fact that I, um, I consider myself lucky, blessed really, because if she had continued taking the medicine, I, I use the analogy that I would have been flushed down the toilet and I wouldn't have been so so small that a couple of rats could have eaten me in the sewer, and, which is true. But I mean, that, that could have been what my fate was. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for her fear for her own life, it probably would have been. But I think Did it's Did you ever so, have any reconciliation with her? No. No, I, right. I, got, to the, I got to the point where I... I could forgive her, but she was already dead. So Seriously? she was. Oh no, she was dead. Dead. Oh, yeah, okay. she died. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she, you know, she was. I took her and my father in um, when they they needed a place to live, and uh, they they were so bad. My mother, especially, it was so bad that I thought that they were going to break my husband and me up. It was like a war zone. So she hadn't changed at all. She was just, just a mean person. And, um, you know, she died first. And I remember my father, when I came home that day, I didn't know she died. And he said, you know, the worst has happened. And I said to her, what's the, I said to him, what's the worst? And he said, your mother died. And I just stood there looking at him like, death doesn't make someone nice. This woman was awful her entire life <laughs> you know i mean just mean and it's like, it just it just amazed me how his perception was so different but of course he was the cause he was the cause of her being like that i think because he had had you know 20 30 40 affairs he was he was literally a whore so and she knew this within a year of marrying him so i mean the the dynamics were complex as well as um i mean i don't know how i ever turned out as good as i did i really don't i mean i really i should be sitting on a corner somewhere with a bottle of wine you know it's it's amazing but, but when uh, you think of it this is isn't this the most powerful story because isn't this the story of either any one of the women that we might see going in on a saturday or monday or wednesday mm-hmm could be well, the same. Yeah. You know, yeah. Cynthia, the idea yeah. that you were given life yeah. through a quirk, if you will. Yeah. All right. Through the mm -hmm. fact that she had a bigger fear of death than yeah. she had of, of killing you. Yeah. That shouldn't have any you know, fear but, of that. But them. see the way that your life has turned out yeah. to become a very meaningful and important part of your community. And no, now we lose all these yeah. babies. Mm -hmm. And we never know their potential. We mm -hmm. never know who they may become. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think, um, I, if she had not told me, and I've said this to Rhonda before, if she had not told me that the reason she stopped was because she was afraid she might die, 
the relationship might have been saved in some way. But once I heard that, I never cared for her again. And I knew she didn't care for me. So, yes. I mean, we're just, we were just related. Wait, wait a minute, Cynthia. Yeah. As yeah. You, be, you have the grace to become a yeah. Christian Catholic. Yes, you have definitely. the grace to forgive her. You have the grace to take mm -hmm. care of her in her old mm -hmm. age, in spite of all this. Yeah, and so That's because true. of you and your and your ability to forgive her on some spiritual level, in spite of all of this, is, you know, someday you might find that your prayers actually did put her in purgatory, and that one day you'll be forever together, mm -hmm. forever heaven that's possible because how likely was it that you would survive i know and become a catholic with that background or how likely that i would survive a mother who had many abortions so she was yeah. very different from your mother she loved me greatly mm -hmm. but you know i survived probably it was just the time that sister faustina was telling people jesus was asking them to pray for women having abortions when mm -hmm. i was conceived and mm -hmm. saved mm -hmm. well yeah it's you know it is when we look at the you know we'll look at the bigger picture it's always fascinating but, um, but this is something cynthia to really understand through the microcosm of your life of your experience of your mother and your father right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know Rhonda just really touched on a, a critical point yeah and, and i don't want us to get past this i want us to read back go back and examine this because you know we are here but for the grace of god yeah. whether we believe in him or not mm -hmm. i agree he created us, yeah. right so yeah so he's he is where he is right and mm -hmm. He's providing us these opportunities for reconciliation. And mm -hmm. as long as we're alive, mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to grow in relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And his, his mysterious plan for you was to bring you into a place where you find fulfillment in a seminary where your story is going to be a powerful story of a meaning of one life. Mm -hmm. But um, the other side of this is, I have to bring us back to sad songs. This is another reason why we try tirelessly, year in and year out, two of my friends are in their 80s. Mm -hmm. One yeah, friend is from, they're both from New York City, and, and they're, they're just the most dynamic women mm -hmm. and fearless. Mm -hmm. And every child who could be saved yeah as an advocate yeah i think you know i think it's important to realize it's not just saving the baby right you're saving you're saving a whole life and you don't know how that will turn out and also of course you prevent a woman from committing a really bad mortal sin <laughs> um but um i look at myself and i'm not i'm a far cry from a great person but you know i ended up in the weirdest it's just a weird situation you know i um i uh ended up converting to catholicism and um went on for a, uh, a 90 credit master's and a licentiate so i could teach in a seminary and it's like i look back at that and i mean as i've as i state in the book i have had uh, I've been involved in the academic formation of well over 200 seminarians who are now priests. And I've, um, I mean, with all the sisters and the priests at uh, Holy Apostles that were students, I mean, probably hundreds of priests and sisters who were going on for a master's mm -hmm. or sometimes a bachelor's for the sisters and I mean, hundreds and hundreds of lay people. So the evidently, evidently, Jesus knew what he was doing when he saved you from that <laughs> medicine. That a Jesus always medicine. knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing. He said, she's yeah. going to be mine someday. But, yes, yeah, but it's, yeah it's, it is amazing to me. So I gave, I actually gave the book to my uh, parish priest because I, I lived in Connecticut for many years. Now I'm up here in Vermont because my 
deceased husband was from Vermont, so we lived here. We got a new priest here at the parish. He's wonderful. Um, Filipino man who's just full of love and hope and joy. I mean, I've never seen the man even just have a, a, no, no expression. He's never had a bad expression or no expression. He's always smiling and happy. So I sent him the book. And Your book? I did. Yeah, I did. And I thought that may be the end of his happiness with me. <laughs> but anyway, so I gave him the book. And, um, you know, we, we talked about it. And he was like, you know, it, it was important. Um. He also said it was it was amazing that I had survived through it. You know, you know, do you know the name Gianna Jessen? I've heard it. Gianna is from California. Mm -hmm. She was in California back in the early um, in the early eighties when um, my former wife and my son and I were there, mm -hmm. and she had come to uh, Rochester, New York, in mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, the spring of ninety two, mm -hmm. and she spoke. She is a survivor of a saline abortion. Oh. Father Marx had a panel of mm -hmm. uh, four or five people who were survivors of abortion. Mm -hmm. And each of their stories is one of the more powerful dimensions of mm -hmm. our pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated to have an opportunity under the circumstances of this interview on sad songs to listen to what is really a hopeful song. Mm-hmm. Look at the way God used you and the yeah. and the evil, the mm -hmm. evil that existed that surrounded mm -hmm. the you know the, the fertilization of, of your mom's egg by your father's sperm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we don't necessarily consider that an act of love. No. And but it was look at what God created. Mm -hmm. Look at all these seminarians yeah. and all these vocations that have yeah. been fostered as a result of your determination to Follow mm -hmm. where God is leading you. Yeah, and we need to I, provide yeah. this hope for any woman who's walking on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. We want yeah. to see this hope. We want to see these hope in the faces of each woman on the sidewalk. I, I agree. It's you know, it, you know, if you live and you can manage to get past the uh, knowledge of what's happened to you, which mm -hmm. is not easy, um, but if you can get past that, uh, then you can have, at minimum, a normal life, you know, and I consider myself as having had a very good life. You know, the, the thing that that um, that amazes me is um, when I, my husband, my first husband who died of esophageal cancer was a very devout Catholic. I have no idea why he married me, <laughs> because at that point I was not Catholic. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we married, and his mother had always wanted to go to Rome. And uh, we took her there for her 85th birthday, along with the, with the kids. And um, we were in Rome, and I had said to him, you know, because I wasn't Catholic, I wasn't religious, I said, you know, I'd like to just, you know, you guys go do your religious stuff, and I'll go see Rome. And then one day he said to me... Um, would you take a tour with us so we can do something as a family? And I said, well, we do have breakfast and dinner together. I was really trying to get out of that. It didn't work. So uh, he found one tour that only had one religious spot on it. And uh, it was the catacombs. And he said, just stay on the bus. So I thought I would. I just had no interest in Catholicism or anything, really. Anyway, any religion. So he... Um, he found this tour, we went on it, and when they turned off the bus, first there was no bathroom, and second there was no air conditioning in Rome in August. So I decided to go in the catacombs. <laughs> you know, I think God did that on purpose. Anyway, so I got that, got out of the bus. He keeps the next trick up his sleeve, Cynthia. <laughs> yeah. So I was walking through the, the like this big area of the catacombs, and uh, people were having mass, and I was so ignorant that I said to myself, why are these people having mass today? It's not Sunday. <laughs> right? So anyway, surprise. No, but your point of view was very consistent from a person who, you know, had been coming through what you had gone through. Yeah, so I walked through, followed the tour till I finally got to it. You had to go on a tour there because I guess people have actually wandered off and gotten killed by falling down and or get lost, whatever. So I was there, and there was a, 
a stone kind of table, which I'm assuming was their altar. And there was a man, an Asian man in a uh, black cassock, who I assume was a priest or at least a deacon. Anyway, so he was talking, and this has happened to me twice, um, in my whole life, twice. So I had like this ticker tape go through my brain, and it said, um, which I could visibly see, and it said, the truth, with a capital T, is found in the Catholic Church. Now, my immediate reaction was not, where'd that come from? My immediate reaction is, whoever typed that shouldn't have put a capital T on truth. And I was, <laughs> they spelled it wrong. And then I said, wait a minute, where did that come from? You know, and <laughs> no idea. Anyway, so um, I didn't say anything to, to my husband or to uh, Susan or anyone until we got home to Connecticut. And I said to my husband, because he was a devout Catholic. And uh, I said, you know, I want you to call your parish priest because I'm going to convert. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, something like, what? And he said, no, that, that's not funny. Or something. I, yeah, I can't, can't remember the exact words. But anyway, so I, um, I said, no, I'm serious. So it was weird because I went there. I studied with him for a year. He said at the end, you have more interest than the average convert. You should go to this place where I used to teach, Holy Apostles College and Seminary. He had wow. just that day received a registration form in the mail in case he, in case he knew anyone that should go. So I went, got a 90 wow. credit master's, and then Father Mosey, the rector, came Ronnie, to me. Ronnie, you me. And I said, uh, here we go again. <laughs> so Father Mosey came and he said, you know, you're more interested in this than most uh, converts. And I thought, uh, here we go again. And, uh, and he said, if you go to Dominican House and study for a licentiate, I will hire you as a professor. So I had a 90 credit master's. I was already a doctor of, uh, in sociology. So I went I, I asked my husband, and he was starting, my first husband was starting to fail. So he said he could sit in the condo in the TV room and watch TV, or he could sit in our camper and watch TV. So we went to Washington and lived in the camper for two years, and Father Mosey did hire me. Wow. And, uh, so, you know, so it's like things just fell in place in a way that is not normal. It's not natural, I should say. It's more supernatural. Well, God's, you know, God's, God's the author of life, right? Yeah, yeah. Who are we to say the lines he draws in between? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Well, to boot, you know, a few years later, I decided to write the story of the abortion attempt of my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided to go to Albertus Magnus for an MFA in writing so I could do a good job on it because I really thought it was important, you know. Ah. And um, I was driving down to Holy Apostles one night. I was going to, uh, you know, teaching at night there. And uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, do I really want to do nonfiction or could I, could I do, um, you know, pro-life fiction? And <laughs> I got the ticker tape thing again. <laughs> and it said, do nonfiction. So I was driving and I took my hand off the wheel. I said, okay <laughs> i mean i know it's like there's no point in fighting <laughs> so so i did go and i and i wrote the book but that's that's um it's just amazing to me when i look back over my life when you're going forward you don't see all these things clicking together but when right, you right. get older and you look back it's like wow there was a path there i was supposed to be on and every time i, I started straying off i got slapped back onto it <laughs> so, yeah, that's, a testimony. that's a testimony that I can relate to. I'm sure mm -hmm. Rhonda can relate to. You mm -hmm. know, um, I don't have the academic prowess that you and Rhonda have, but I know from Rhonda's story that Rhonda's had some incredible encounters in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I find some in my lifetime. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about this, um, this privilege of uh, working to become like a monk, right, mm -hmm. with Rhonda, since we wrote Always a New Beginning, 
and we mm-hmm. worked on uh, the rule of an artist together. Mm-hmm. The experience of just returning to my little apartment in Florida after mm-hmm. each day uh, that we were on the sidewalks and mm-hmm. just taking my notes and composing my notes and writing my essay is a very humble act of service. Mm-hmm. And I did not know where this was leading. Mm-hmm. But you have a sense of trusting. Yeah. And you have a sense that, you know, uh, people, I was posting some of these uh, essays on my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have friends who are in pro life, and some of my friends were writing in and encouraging me. I mm-hmm. shared some of these with Rhonda. Rhonda, you remember your encouragement? And, um, you know, what you do is you just you, you follow where our Lord is opening doors. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, I lived in Connecticut for many years. And I know that I had some real challenges, but I look back at these challenges and truthfully, as a result of writing Always a New Beginning, I sincerely can go back and review these encounters I had. And I can remember that I wasn't by myself in some of these moments, even though I felt by myself at the time. Mm-hmm. They're all formational. Some of our greatest sorrows are some of our most important formational experiences. Yeah. And well, I'm hoping kind of, that maybe this, the experience of a woman who reads this book yeah. might, yeah, might be looking at her own sorrows. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, you don't, as I said, you don't realize it when you're going through it. Right. But when you look back, I can see this whole path that I was on and never really realized. You know, so... How do you... How do you, um, how do you distinguish the hand of God on this path? Because very interesting to listen Ow. to your your um, complete what I say. I'm going to forgive me, but I put words. Your secular point of view, when your husband was encouraging you to go on the tour in in Rome, you remember your very specific thoughts as yeah. you responded to your husband, yeah. and you remember your very specific thoughts because you know they um, they characterized who you were as a person during the time yeah. you. You had them, right? The ticket yeah. tape occurred yeah. at a point in time and you had been formed up until that point in time. Yeah. And now we go yeah. forward in time. I I will tell you, walking into uh, St. Bridget of Kildare one Sunday, like I did every Sunday in Buddhist Connecticut for the Latin Mass, mm-hmm. we had a dentist who was part of our community and her car pulled up and out of the passenger side of her car stepped Rhonda Jervin. Oh. And I looked at Rhonda, and I looked, I don't know if you can remember this moment, Rhonda, but looking at you, I remembered you from California. Now, yes. I can't explain why this moment occurred, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. This is one of those special times in our lives when our Lord has yeah. got his hand in our life. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really when you think of it, you live. I'm 73 years old, and it's like so. I've lived a lengthy life, and when I go go back, there's just these individual points where something happened, and I mean, I can I can give them to people in less than five minutes that cover 73 years, and yet they have entirely altered my life. So, um, <clears throat> David, why don't you say a closing prayer? All right, dear Lord, we're gathered together in your name, and we're gathered together to serve your glory. And dear Lord, we know that we're we're carrying a cross in our age, in our time, Lord, just as you carried the cross for us on Good Friday. Jesus, we bring our suffering to you, and we ask you to share your suffering with us. And then we present the suffering that each of us has endured that Cynthia has endured, that Rhonda has endured, that I have endured, that the people who this book, um, uh, this, their stories are told in this book, that the suffering they endure. We offer this back to you, dear Jesus, in reparation for those people who who just turn away from you, who, who don't even have the slightest um, thought of, of the suffering you you gave for us of the purpose of your suffering, of the purpose of your suffering to destroy the power of these very sins over us frail human beings. Dear Jesus, 
we offer Thanksgiving for the privilege for myself to have the privilege to speak with Rhonda and Cynthia on this incredible topic this evening. To listen to Cynthia's testimony, to know Rhonda's story, and to listen to her reflections and to remember the good discussions we've had and the struggles that she's had in her old life. Dear Lord, your faith is so much a gift. Please keep in our hearts the awareness of your gift. And please, please plant the seed in the readers of this book, the presence of your gift. We ask this under the care of our Blessed Mother, and the care of St. Faustina, through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, well, this was a hopefully very productive interview, and I've enjoyed talking to both of you. Okay, so, thank you. Cynthia, and we are so delighted that you survived everything. Yes. So am that. I. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. amen. God bless yeah. you all. God bless bye -bye. you. God bless yeah. you. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye.